In this talk, I shall first be talking about who were the enemies of the Nazi state, and then discussing the implications for the second generation, the children of the refugees who escaped to Britain before the outbreak of war. I shall not be focusing on what gave rise to Nazism, the resistance to it before or during, its relationship to class, or about the very different interpretations of the Nazi regime. I also need to confess before I continue that I am the child of political refugees from Nazism whose wider German family were murdered as Jews, so I have a personal interest in this topic. There are fundamental differences in the explanations or historiography of the Nazis' policies of exclusion and extermination. The perspective which emphasizes the Jews as Nazism's main enemy and that the Nazis always wanted to exterminate the Jews is relatively recent. An earlier very different paradigm put far more emphasis on the Nazis' first target being communists and socialists, a perspective still common in much of Europe. Waxman's recent book, A History of Nazi Concentration Camps, is rooted in this second position, which I shall be intermittently drawing from. It confirms that the Nazis were from the beginning out to get the communists, their first enemies. Although this is certainly not the dominant view amongst commentators, as socialists, we would expect that the Nazi regime's first goal would be the annihilation of workers' organizations and therefore the communists and trade unionists. Though one mustn't underestimate the glue of anti-Semitism and xenophobia amongst the early Nazi fanatics, and that the Nazis often equated communists with Jews, the degree to which the Nazis were from the start violently anti-communist is shown at their beginnings. The Freikorps, early recruits into the new Nazi party, organized an armed and ultimately successful assault on the 1918-1919 Bavarian workers' uprising. Though there's no time to develop on this, the Nazis understood 1918-1919 as a pivotal moment. It was, as they saw it, when the German working class deserted Germany. The Nazi leadership retained a terror of the organized working class throughout their regime, which contributed to the early smashing of working class organization. And Mason argued their awareness of the possibility of working class resistance moderated their policies until the outbreak of war, including their willingness to use extreme violence. A few facts and figures. On the night of the Reichstag fire in February 33, the SA and the police rounded up and detained hundreds of leading communists. Within days, 5,000 communists were arrested, and the, the German Communist Party was banned. In March and April alone, 40 to 50,000 political opponents were taken into protective custody. About 200,000 political prisoners overall were detained in 1933. In June, the Nazis banned the German Social Democrats, the biggest opposition party, and the trade unions. The SA and then the SS trashed town halls, publishing houses, party and union offices, and hunted down not just members of the KPD, but members of organizations the KPD were associated with, in sports clubs, artistic and literary circles, humanist groups, etc. In a way which we aren't familiar with, the Communist Party was at the center of a spider's web of working class activities. The Nazis' first act was to smash the organizations of the working class, declared to be the principal enemy of the new Germany, and to eliminate its leaders. The fights between the Communists and the Nazis were also personal. I interviewed three German Communists who had organized against the Nazis, and they all said that for many years before 33, there had been regular local battles between the Red Front, often but not always KPD, and SA thugs. After the Reichstag fire, the SA were out for revenge, personal revenge. The KPD had also left itself open to slaughter. I mean, this is stuff we know, but again, this isn't the place to go into the implications of the third period, but the KPD leadership had totally underestimated the Nazis. <coughs> 
They failed to take anti-Nazi work seriously to too late. They saw the Social Democrats as attempting to replace them as um, the main organizers for the German working class, and therefore the main enemy. After Hitler became chancellor in January 33, the KPD leadership, unlike some in the rank and file, failed to understand the threat to their organization and members. Even after the Nazis were elected in March, the KPD leadership, for example, and Norsky was arguing after them, as the Nazis, us. Communists were there for the picking. The first camps such as Dachau were constructed for communist prisoners, where hundreds lost their lives just in 33. Communists still accounted for about 80% of camp inmates in 1934, and were the main focus for the sweeps in 1935. In 1936, about 3,700 of the 4,700 concentra concentration camp inmates were political prisoners. Any communists still in Germany got picked up in 38, when political prisoners still formed the majority of camp inmates. Once war broke out, communist agitators were singled out for eradication. When the Nazis first experimented with Zyklon B in Auschwitz in 41, the first prisoners they experimented on were the Soviet POWs. Some of the first to be systematically gassed were the political prisoners from across Europe, especially those they had picked up in France who had fought in the Spanish Civil War. The hatred of the Nazis towards communists was so overwhelming that Soviet POWs were the only nationality in the camps that the Nazis didn't subdivide and, and, and subdivide Jews separately. Other groups were also targeted as enemies before the outbreak of war and sent to the camp. Camps, the Jehovah Witnesses, homosexuals, Roma, the mental defectives, all this in quotes. Anyone categorized as Slav, such as the Poles, Poles and of course Jews who are becoming onto. One category who often, often get ignored are the asocials, seen as degenerates, the immoral, criminals, and especially heinous, the jobless. By the end of 1938, asocials formed the largest group in the camps. The fate, of the, the fate of the asocials highlights the degree to which the Nazi priority needs to be understood as economic as well as, or even as opposed to, ideological. The camps were now seen as a separate economy using slave labor, there to make money, and increasingly to contribute to Germany's war economy. If the asocials were non-productive, they were killed. As Waxman puts it, economics and extermination were understood as two sides of one coin. Between 38 and 1945, camp prisoners were used in many of Germany's commanding industries. Most famous is the Farben site attached to Auschwitz, but there was also cooperation with BMW and VW, amongst others. Towards the end of the war, camp labor was used to build missiles, including the V2s. The original supply of slave laborers were the tens of thousands of Russian POWs, and as Slavs as well as communists, they were doubly subhumans. In practice, they contributed little and were almost all worked to death. Although Auschwitz is seen as the heart of the Nazi killing machine, its function was as much economic. It was the subhuman Jews who were seen as the Soviets' natural replacement. There are diverse meanings of Jewishness, which I'm also not going into, so please forgive me if I use the shorthand of the word Jew. I'm not going to rehearse here the different explanations for the mass murder of the Jews, but if the death camps were not inevitable, why did the Nazis decide to exterminate the Jews? The chronology provides some clues. There is no doubting the visceral anti-Semitism of some leading hardcore Nazis such as Hitler and Goebbels and many of the SS commandants, which included an acceptance of a deliberate murder. But Weizmann convincingly argues that there were many escalating stages in anti-Semitic practices before state genocide started, but that these stages were not a part of a Nazi master plan Ending in, ending in final extermination. From 33, legislative discrimination against Jews in Germany meant Jews lost their rights and their assets 
but not generally their lives. Although the Kristallnacht program of 1938 marks the beginning of a more systematic persecution of Jews, the policy was not to exterminate, but rather to severely limit their rights and encourage Jews to leave Germany. Though Jews had to have a clean political record and agree to relinquish all rights to their property before being allowed out. From 1939, the policy was one of ghettoization of the Jewish populations and also other enemies of the state in Nazi-occupied Europe, especially Poland. Though conditions were subhuman in, in these ghettos, death through attrition is distinct from systematized murder. Up to the outbreak of war, Jews who were already in the camps were still generally given the option of leaving Germany if they could afford to and could find somewhere to take them. Even when war first broke out, in theory, productive Jews were exempt from imprisonment. But the outbreak of war marked a significant increased intensity in anti-Semitic policies Though even by 1943, most European Jews were still in ghettos, not in camps. So as opposed to the position which ascribes to the Nazi leadership a systematic genocidal intent, Waxman argues Nazi Germany did not follow a preordained path to extreme terror. But what occurs after Germany starts losing, after Stalingrad, is that the Nazis drain out the ghettos and prisons into the camps arguably because of their need for slave labor. But there was a dilemma much debated amongst the Nazi hierarchy. The intensifying need to maintain industrial and agricultural output versus their obsession with getting rid of the Jews. In practice from 43 onwards, it is impossible to know whether more Jewish prisoners were killed by impossibly hard labor, starvation and disease, or in the gas chambers. However, the increase in camp numbers in 44 and 45 cannot be reduced to Himmler's drive for slave laborers or an economic rationale. As defeat loomed, and especially after the unsuccessful attempt on Hitler's life, Operation Thunder Thunderstorm, wonderful word, first dragged in any remaining lefty and foreign resistance fighters from across Europe, they went for them. But then Jews from France, Ireland, sorry, Holland, Slovakia, Greece and Italy, and half a million from Hungary were gathered up for deliberate extermination. The numbers overall in the camps was greater in January 45. It's extraordinary. They knew they were losing. But the numbers in the camps were greater in January 45 than at any other time. Finally, the ideological trumped the economic imperative. To agree that the ideology of Nazism contained within itself the possibility of a Holocaust is not the same as seeing the Holocaust as inevitable, nor do the different stages of anti-Semitic policy inevitably lead to extermination, even though the earlier stages were a necessary precondition. Why did genocide against the Jews finally become autonomous? I'm going to suggest some possible explanations. As the Nazis resorted to levels of repression and um, omission that alarm even some in the Nazi party, as the previous support, or at least consent, amongst the industrial elite and melted away, as the dissidents within the military were crushed, and as the leadership ceased to fear working class resistance, the original hardline anti-communist but also anti-Semitic faction in the Nazi party gained unchallenged authority. But there is an alternative emphasis. Rather than defeating the inferior race of Slavs, succeeding in their colonial pursuit of con conquering Slav lands, defeating communist ideology and bringing about the collapse of the USSR, the Nazis were being defeated by the very communists whom they had fought to rid the world of. It is in this contact of Nazi Germany's defeat plus the Nazi belief that behind every communist lurked a Jew, that they decided at least, that at least they would accomplish the final solution and exterminate the Jews. I want to create a bridge to the issue of the second generation by briefly mentioning the issue of displacement. As we've seen, the Nazi state from its inception constructed an ideological chasm between the us and the them, 
the outsider, the non-Aryan, creating an unheard of number of stateless people. The first refugees, a few thousands, were the communists and members of the left literati, but most refugees, approximately 70,000, arrived here mainly between Kristallnacht, 1938, and Avrey of War. London estimates that only about 1 in 10 of those who applied were allowed into the UK. Indeed, Traverso calculates there were alone some 400,000 Jewish refugees from Central Europe, up to 39, trying to find a new country. There is a topic for another day as to why so many people left it so late to try to get out. The war then created millions more refugees, almost none of whom were let into Britain. My research interest originally was how, in how the experience of the people who escaped the Nazis before the outbreak of World War II and became refugees in Britain had affected their children. The common perception is that refugees from Nazism arrived in Britain because they were fleeing anti-Semitism. What I found was that although most of their parents were in one sense or another Jewish, the parents had mostly also been political. And in most cases, they had fled primarily, either, sorry, primarily, because of their politics, or at least some part for, for political reasons. My sample included a range, I didn't know that this was going to happen, but my sample included a range of people from those with communist parents to those without any political background. Except for one person, all the interviewees' parents were in one sense or another Jewish, and in all cases had lost their parents and sometimes virtually all their families. What I had not expected was how far the deaths or murder of their grandparents weighed down on all the second generation interviewees, though their parents rarely or never talked to them about their grandparents and the interviews, interviewees had never known them. As Peter typically stated, he could not tell me one story about his grandparents, adding, when one's grandparents have been murdered, their absence can become overwhelming. I couldn't say why my strength of identification with that fact. That my grandparents were murdered was so strong that it was. This theme ran, ran through almost all the interviews, irrespective of political or religious identification. There were many other similarities which I don't have time to develop, but to mention a few quickly, this is a group, although born here, who did not generally identify themselves as British. Most of the interviewees saw themselves in one form or another as outsiders, and had done so for all their lives. Another similarity is that parents, whether political or not, did not, not talk much or at all to their children about what had happened to their murdered kin, or about their lives before arriving in Britain. All the interviewees talked to the silence of their parents about the past. Again, the level of anxiety expressed by the interviewees in different forms was also uniformly high. Almost all of the second generation, whether, whether, whatever their political or religious background, continued to feel burdened by the ghosts of the past. There is, however, a crucial distinction here between the interviewee, interviewees who presented themselves and their parents as victims because they had fled and been persecuted for what they were, or anyway, were seen as being, and on the other hand, those whose parents were persecuted for what, had actu what they had actually chosen to do. The issue of victimhood in relation to parents is complex, at least at one level, our parents were in reality the victims of Nazism. But here the, meaning is the, here the meaning is the adoption of victimhood of, as part of who one feels one is, as an internal state of being. There was a notable absence of pride in refugee parents by the second generation, despite parents having had enough awareness and the courage to become exiles. Kellerman suggested the children of Holocaust survivors, a group often compared with the children of Holocaust victims, present patterns of difficulties, including impaired self-esteem, with persistent identity problems and an over-identification with parents' victim status. Novik, among others, and this is interesting, argues that the historical shift towards seeing the Jews as the target of Nazism has encouraged both a greater identification with Jewishness and in a sense of exclusive and inevitable victimhood. <clears throat> 
The historiography of the Holocaust is not just an academic exercise. Constructions of what the Nazis did and to whom have an impact on thought and emotion. But having parents who actively opposed the Nazis made it different to the second generation's sense of victimhood. John, whose father had been a Jewish communist Austrian, said, what didn't ring a bell when he attended second generation group with me was this idea of being a victim. I never saw myself as a victim, although he said there had been suffering along the way. Mike, whose Jewish father had fairly traveled with the communists and who had lost virtually all his Czech family, said his father never saw himself as a victim. It would have seemed balmy to him. Tanya, despite her German, non-Jewish, KPD father bearing the physical and psychological scars of being tortured for the rest of his life, was adamant that neither her parents nor her were victims. She viewed him with admiration because he had chosen to act against Nazism out of principle, knowing that he was putting his life at risk. Quote, many in the second generation see their parents as victims, so feel sorry for them. But if you see them as heroes, you feel proud of them. At a second generation meeting I was at, a woman said to me, you don't know how lucky you are to feel proud of your parents, to which there was not much nodding of heads round the table. Ruth Kitchen argues in a paper on Charlotte Delbo that resistance allowed the anti-Nazi to maintain a, la a less fractured self and a greater ability to reassemble the pieces which impacted on their children. Maybe when the parents of the second generation children provided a coherent, even if not personalized narrative of the past, this encouraged the child's understanding of why their parents had become